Hello, everyone. Sorry, we're running a little bit behind. I just um, having some technical difficulties. Murphy's Law, right? Okay, so um, we'll wait for a few more people to join the chat anyway, to join the, the Zoom. So if you could just let me know um, your name, maybe where you're coming from. I see people have already started doing that, but I'm also interested in knowing who you are in this sort of language learning stratosphere. So are you a language um, instructor? Are you a language learner? Are you both? Are you uh, a self-identifying polyglot? Please let me know um, in the chat. So, because we want to make sure we can keep this like very interactive. Um, also, just a little bit of housekeeping. There's going to be a Q and A um, directly immediately after this talk. I think the link is going to maybe pop up at the um, towards the end um, of the of the talk. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll leave some time at the end of this talk so that you can ask me some questions if you have them. Um, but if you uh, want to have maybe ask me something that may take a little bit longer to answer, feel free to join the Q&A after this talk. And then one more thing, I'm going to have a couple of polls, just really some questions rather, that I'm going to have in the slides themselves that just um, ask you some questions so that we can keep this very interactive. Um, I, as you probably gleaned from my um, title, I'm a classroom teacher, so I really thrive off of being able to interact with people that I'm speaking to. So um, I'm going to write some questions. There's some questions that are going to appear in the talk. And so please make sure you answer them. All right. So we got a lot of people telling me we were freelance English for adults. OK, an English teacher from Berlin, Nora, a German teacher from Munich. OK, Katia is a polyglot wannabe. That sounds great. <laughs> French teacher in Germany um, and from Munich. OK, great. So we have a lot of people who are occupying a lot of different roles from a lot of different places. I am so excited to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining. OK, so as in the as the title suggests, from classroom teacher to content creator, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. Um, my sort of career journey, I guess you could say, and how I went from being a classroom teacher to being a content creator slash e-learning instructor, I guess you could say. Um, so we'll go, go ahead and jump right in there. And um, so I started out actually um, just very quickly as a ninth grade English teacher in the United States. So I've basically taught Shakespeare and Beowulf and Canterbury Tales to a bunch of kids who couldn't care less about it. <laughs> so I did that for several years and I enjoyed it a lot, but then I moved abroad. And so I sort of pivoted into teaching English as a foreign language, which I actually ended up enjoying a little bit more because it allowed me to um, sort of get a little bit more instant gratification from my students in terms of seeing their growth and their progress. When you teach English to English speakers, you know, the, the progress is very incremental and it's, you know, you may not actually see the fruits of your instructional labor until years down the line. Whereas when you're teaching English as a foreign language, you teach somebody a phrase or a sentence structure and they can start using that immediately. So it's really, really cool. And I've really enjoyed um, the transition from English teaching to English teaching for English speakers to English um, for speakers of other languages. I've really enjoyed doing that. Okay, so next I started actually, um, the next part of my career journey, I started working for a wonderful company called Chatterbug. So I promise you this is not a shameless marketing plug, um, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my, the company that I work for because it's sort of pertinent to the talk itself. So um, I started, I, I wrote, co-wrote a curriculum for, um, for English for this language learning software um, where we have live lessons and, and students do um, interactive um, speaking activities with a native, a native speaker of the, of the target language. And so I created, um, I helped create some of those learning materials with my, with my partner. 
Now, in that process, I actually had to relinquish a lot of control, right? So that was sort of the first step in the journey of becoming a teacher, a traditional teacher that had sort of God-like complex, right? Of this is all, these are the things that you need to know. These are the things you need to learn that you need to understand. But then I started writing curriculum and essentially I was giving my learning materials to someone else to be able to do what they saw fit to do with the material. And so then this latest pivot um, has been, we just recently launched a new product that supports our, our core product and that's Chatterbug Streams. And it's basically live streaming platform where you can engage via chat and um, using emojis and taking quizzes while listening to a language instructor who is streaming live, right? And so I myself am a streamer, an English streamer, obviously. And if you see, if you see any, um, any similarities in the image there and in the background, I'm actually in the Chatterbug streaming studio right now, um, giving my talk. So this is where all the magic happens, okay? And so in now becoming a content creator, essentially, once you move from being a traditional teacher, you sort of, like I said, you have to start sort of relinquishing control and saying, okay, I am no longer in control of what students who, in, in, in the context of a, of a uh, streaming service, what users actually want to learn, right? So I no longer have that power, right? Students are the ones, the users are the ones who be, are able to tell me or try to figure out what it is that they want to learn. So essentially teachers in, 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 this, kind of, in this kind of structure become sort of like salespeople, right? So I'm essentially a salesman at, of some sort where I'm basically trying to convince you as a user that I know what you need to learn or this is the information that you should learn on your language learning journey, right? And so um, I got to make sure as a teacher that you're buying what I'm selling, right? So the user has all the control in this situation. The teacher in this situation doesn't have any control. Now, in trying to figure out how to become a good content creator, I've had to learn like basically how to get people engaged in, the, in, in, in what I am instructing on, right? And so if you clicked on this talk because I said TikTok, that was sort of already me trying to be a little bit crafty and getting you to click on um, and click on this talk. Uh, I'm not gonna really focus on TikTok, but TikTok is a big thing. And so uh, I made sure I added that to the title just in case uh, that would, you know, that would be, interesting for somebody, right? And so I've had to sort of learn how to create catchy titles, catchy descriptions, choose thumbnails that are, that would engage, would help people actually click or interact with the material that I was putting out there. And then also not only, and then once they got into the stream itself, making sure that they stayed put, right? Because the, the, the streams, they go from anywhere between five minutes and 15 minutes and you know, with the TikTok culture, we know that people's attention spans are shrinking, right? Or they not shrinking in the way that like people can't focus on something for 15 minutes, but people need constant change in order to stay actively engaged. All right. And so how do you do that in a 15 minute stream when there's TikTok, you're competing with TikTok videos that are what, 30 seconds or 40 seconds, something like that. And how do you keep users actually engaged in your stream? Right. And so this is one of the poll questions I wanted to ask. Um, how, let me know in the chat how do you actually select the videos that you click on, right? So with, with TikTok, for example, it's sort of on an infinity scroll. Uh, I think that's what it's called, an infinity scroll. But on YouTube, um, on YouTube, right, you, even though there's an algorithm that sort of pushed different content for you, you're still sort of the, the, the creator of, of clicking on the video that you want to, that you want to watch, right? So is it catchy titles that usually um, make you click on a video? Is it the thumbnails themselves, right? I spend a lot of time picking thumbnails. So hopefully thumbnails are one of the reasons that get you to actually click on a video. So yeah, let me know in the chat. I see a couple of people have already started answering interests and thumbnails. I choose only what's relevant to me. Very good. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, things that match my most current interest. Interest. Okay, so a lot of people actually are clicking on 
on titles or they're clicking on videos basically based on their interest. I'm glad you actually said that. So one of the things, um, so <clears throat> in thinking about content creation, but in the, in the sort of structure of e-learning, right? we've started to moving towards a model of what we call micro learning, right? And so in traditional education, right? In language learning classes, you usually teach this and then this and then this and then this. But with, with e-learning, you students should have the flexibility to be able to choose what it is that they want to learn at any given time. And one of the ways that we sort of curate this is by using micro learning techniques. And so that's essentially creating short sort of bursts of information that teaches you something very, very quickly and very succinctly. Now, micro learning has some drawbacks for sure, but some of the some of the, I won't focus on the drawbacks, but some of the, um, the benefits of it is that it allows students to have flexibility to be able to select the things that they want to learn based on their interest and to be able to go through and matriculate through the information in their own, at their own pace, right? So they can go as fast as they want to go. They can go as slowly as they'd like to go. Right. Um, whereas in traditional teaching, it's much more sequential. So and I think that that's a, a much better approach that, you know, if you look at the image that they're puzzle pieces and it doesn't really matter how you put the puzzle together in and of itself, but is that you sort of adding the information blocks to your understanding of, of, of a language, right? And essentially we know that that's, this is how kids learn, that they don't learn thing, they don't learn a language sequentially, they learn it as based on their interests, the things that they're interested in, and based on the things that they need to know at any given time. So this particular approach of micro learning is much more focused on interests, which a lot of you have already um, indicated is very important to you, and need, okay, and need. All right, so let's go to the next thing. So I wanna talk a little bit about memory and language learning. Now, last year I got obsessed with um, learning about neuroscience, um, David Eagleman in particular. I listened to one podcast and so now I'm pretty much an expert on neuroscience. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, but I won't bore you with my understanding of, of neuroscience, mostly because David Eagleman and there are other people who are far more interesting to listen to and have far more expertise on the topic. But one of the things that I did want to point out is that when we talk about language learning, oftentimes we also have to talk about memory. So David Eagleman makes the point that we hooked, um, we remember things based on hooking them onto something that's already sort of lodged in our brains. And so that can be based on an interest, it can be based on an emotional connection, or some type of need that we have. All right. So this is how we actually retain information. Now, any good educator is going to give you input, right, they're going to give you information in by introducing it with something that you have already learned or something that you already know, right. So if you are, um, if you are, particularly interested in basketball. So maybe teaching you math equations based on basketball is gonna help you to actually retain that information. So there are two things that sort of help cement, well, three things actually that help sort of cement and help you retain information, cement these things in the brain, and that's interest. But the ones that I wanna focus on are sort of the emotional connection, all right, and the need-based. Now, I have a four-year-old, and he is probably my um, most important language student. And he's my most important language student because I'm his parent. I'm his, his language parent and his parent in the, in the real sense, but also because my son actually had um, a speech delay. He was a bit of a late talker. And so he got to be about two and a half, and he was just not really interested in speaking, whereas his peers were already putting together two and three word sentences, sometimes four and five word sentences. He was kind of okay with just pointing at things because he knew we would get it for him or just simply using one word, milk, um, outside, things like that. But he was not putting whole sentences together. And he was re reaching around the age of three. So I was starting to get increasingly more concerned and worried about this. Now, 
he, like most children, really like to play Russian roulette with their lives, and they always are putting themselves in mortal danger. And so he used to he used to like to always play around the stove. And I would say, hey, it's this is hot. It's dangerous. Don't touch that. It's hot, right? Well, of course, he didn't really listen until one day he actually reached his hand. We had a we have a glass top stove. He reached his hand on the stove and he said, "That is hot." He said it just like that. That is hot. And, um, you know, I had two different emotions in this moment. One was ter- I was terrified that, you know, he had hurt himself, um, but he was actually fine. Thank God. Um, but the other emotion that I had was I was ecstatic, right? Because this was his first uh, full sentence that he ever said. That is hot. Now, that's not a huge deal, right? That's not even that many words, but for me, it was everything. And what's so interesting is what came next is that then he started using that structure all the time, right? And he started using it in different contexts, like that is mommy, that is my bear, um, that is cold, right? So he started using that structure all the time. So he had received the input right? When I told him that the stove was hot, but it wasn't until he sort of needed to use it that he actually sort of produced the language. And then he started transferring that same structure into other contexts. And so you probably already know where I'm going with this in terms of language learning, right? And in terms of language learning and memory. Now I have another, um, I have another little anecdote for you about my own sort of experience with language learning, memory, and need. Now, because he actually um, has a speech delay, I have worked really, really hard to like try to find resources and try to get him tested and things like that. Now, I am a German learner. So at the beginning, I asked if you were a language instructor or a language learner. I am also both. Um, for those of you who said both, I am a language instructor, but I'm also a German learner. And I've been a German learner for quite a few years now, and I'm not going to lie, it's a little rough. (laughs) But one of the things that I have been very, very excited about is, um, is that I've had to learn how to navigate getting my son tested and, and helping him to develop his language skills. And because of that, I've had to develop my German language skills in order to help get him the resources that he needs. And I remember looking up the word Entwicklung, which means development in German. And for whatever reason, anytime I think about German, that word always comes to my mind, mostly because I have an emotional connection to it and it had a need for it, right? And so one of the very few topics that I can actually talk about in German with any type of like, you know, zest and fluency is whenever I have to talk about my son's, um, his speech development. And so Again, you probably already know where I'm going with that, but I have, I've had to learn language that's specific to a need that I have, okay? So I have another poll question for you. Um, what foreign word um, will you always remember because it fulfills an individual need? So like I told you, my word is Entwicklung, okay? I'm always gonna remember that word, even if I think I never interact with German again. And Wicklung is always going to be there. So I'd like to know what foreign word or what learned word have you learned that you are going to remember because it fulfilled some type of individual need? <laughs> Somebody said Ausländer Behörde. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, that's a t- that's a that's a really, really important one, right? Especially if you are a am an immigrant or expat living in Berlin. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of words coming in. Donner wet veta. Okay. Factura. All right. Serendipity. That's a great word. All right. Very nice. Um, so we have some more pristine hole. Okay. I wish I should have actually also told me what um asked you to tell me what other language what languages are these words attached to <laughs> okay irgen v that's a good one umbrella huh okay i guess i could see you needing to use the word umbrella all right so um thank you so much you can keep writing those words in the chat um but we're gonna move on because i'm actually running out of time all right so Now, another German word for you, this one is not really based on need, but it kind of gets us to this concept of need and sort of 
and in a, a language learning environment. And that is the word Umwelt. Now, if you were a German speaker, then you would probably know that Umwelt actually just translates to environment. But there is Umwelt like in the sort of more traditional, is this like a theory of Umwelt, which describes, it's a, it's a term that actually is used in biology. And it describes how different species inhabiting the same ecosystem experience that ecosystem or experience their environment in radically different ways, right? So how the lion is experiencing his reality in this picture is gonna be different from the zebras, right? Which is gonna be different from the buffalo. And so their individual, their individual needs is the thing that informs what they actually are going to pay attention to, right? So maybe you've already started drawing the connection of what it is that I'm gonna get at. But what I wanna say, what I wanna compare this to is language learning, right? And so similarly, we all exist in sort of a language learning ecosystem, right? Depending on what language we're learning. And it's chock full of information. That's the one thing that I really wanna get over in this talk, that there is so much information out there. There's so much input. And we have to be selective about what it is that we choose to absorb, right? Absorb and to then hopefully retain. Right. And so our individual needs are going to dictate what our input should actually be. Right. And so you're thinking about, you know, and back to my my story about learning the words in Viklung. Right. This was a need that I had. And so whereas another person might not need to learn the word in Viklung, right, because they don't have a child who has a speech delay or has a developmental issue. But I do. Right. And so with the vast amounts of content that we have at our disposal that we have available to us, we want to make sure that we create sort of a language learning ecosystem that is very individual to us, right? Because back to the sort of neuroscience, the brain can only absorb so much input. So we have to be very selective about the things that we allow to come into our brains. And the way that we do that is we do it based on the things that we are interested in and the things that we need, all right? So this actually allows users and students to essentially become the um, curriculum writers for their own sort of language learning journey. All right, so we're going to come up to the really important part, and that is the if so, then what, right? And I also have like a couple of images there. If you can tell me in the in the chat, what these images, what phrase, because we're talking about this is a sort of presentation, a talk. I'm teaching a little English as well. So there's a presentation, there's a talk, and um, we have these couple of images. And so tell me what phrase these images sort of amount to. Does that make sense? So if you can figure out, oh, somebody already figured it out. Okay, call to action, right? Okay, so at the end of a talk, a presentation, you want to make sure you always tell your audience, if so, if given all this information, then what? What do we do with it? So I have two pieces of wisdom um, to, to impart in you. <laughs> so for language learners, for those of you who said that you're language learners, you wanna make sure that you craft a curricula that is based on your individual needs and interests. So that's how you're gonna be able to decide all the things that you need to look at on YouTube. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Not really, but for language instructors, what do you do, right? If so, then what? If I've said, if I've sort of made the point that you actually don't have much power in terms of, you know, you're just the content creator. You create the content and you put it out there and hope students buy what you're selling or users buy what you're selling. I use students and users interchangeably because in the language learning, in language learning, e-learning sort of context, students and users are essentially one and the same. Um, so what can you do as language instructors if you don't have any power over what your students or what these users are actually want to learn? Well, I think the 
<clears throat> what's the great thing about social media and TikTok and YouTube is that there's already lots of information about what it is that people are actually interested in. That's one of the things that I do a lot when I'm creating my own content for streams is that I really make sure that I'm sort of combing through message boards and looking through comments on, on videos, on language videos on YouTube to see what it is that actually students feel like they need. Because in the traditional classroom, we're telling, we tell students, well, you need to, le to learn colors and you need to learn articles of clothing. But most of the time, people actually want to learn things that are much more practical and much more pertinent to their actual lives. And so scouring the internet and making sure that like you're cre actually creating content that is going to be useful to students out there. And because students have different needs, that means that you need to have very diverse content to be able to try to meet a lot of those needs as well. Okay, so that is kind of it. <laughs> so I tried to leave a few minutes at the end so that I can take a few questions. Um, so let's see if anybody has any questions. So I'll kind of wait around to see. Um, oh, we have a, okay. So somebody says that they have a degree and a master in biochemistry. Okay, so I'm really glad that, uh, Hopefully I did not embarrass myself with my, um, <laughs> with my explanation of neuroscience, <laughs> in which case I'm an expert at, okay? All right, so I think um, we'll probably go ahead and end it there if there are no questions. And um, like I said, we will have a Q&A that's going to be immediately following this talk. And so if you'd like to join me for that, I think we'll actually be able to see each other's faces and sort of have a conversation. So maybe that's interesting to you. I promise I'm, I'm, I'm very nice. <laughs> so if you would like to join the Q&A, please do so and I will see you there. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat>